Hello everyone, this is GM Josh Fidel, and today I'll be doing another video of my autopsy series. For those of you who haven't watched any previous videos or want to recap, it's basically I go over a game from the point of view of whichever side lost, and I try to figure out why they lost. So it's not necessarily about finding the exact mistakes and showing you analysis, which obviously can be useful, but you know, it's very common. But it's more about figuring out what went wrong, like what led to the mistakes that lost the game. And how we can kind of apply this to our own game. So oftentimes I'm going to be going over elite player games, sometimes players who are somewhat weaker. Uh, usually, I haven't done it really like amateur, amateur games, but I might do that at some point as well. But basically, I think that a lot of the same thought processes that affect the very top players can actually affect lower players as well and some of their errors can be errors of players who are regular tournament players uh, obviously they make them elite players make far fewer errors and it's not as common but I think it, it's a lot of the same thing so I really think we can learn a lot from their mistakes and hopefully can apply them so this one was a game from Mamed Yarov's recently in the FIDE knockout uh, against Vojtasek. And to me this was a really funny funny game because they have this position and if you look at this position from a normal standpoint you'd think, oh my goodness, you know, like <laughs> I was probably just going to win for black, maybe there's still some technique to do. And the fact that Mamidjarov, a player who's, you know, t was 2800 a few months ago or whatever it was and, you know, is one of the best players in the world could just lose this is really remarkable but it, it's a good reminder to all of us that you know you don't relax no matter how good your position looks because quite frankly if Mama Jarv can lose this position so can you <laughs> and so can I and it's very important to kind of realize how these things are done and I really wanted to capture this so today's theme is really gonna be big blunders because I'm gonna give two two game examples and in both of them there was a really large blunder which cost one side the game so I would say that that's kind of going to be my goal uh, for this to kind of see how big blunders happen. Because my theory is that for most games, big blunders don't just come out of nowhere. They don't fall from the sky. There's usually wrong ways of thinking and thought process errors and all of this to lead to a big blunder. Occasionally, if, if you find yourself blundering just every game, it probably means you need to work on tactics. There's no real getting around that. But I would say that if you, it's not always it's not always so common, but there are positions where you make tactical blunders far below your level, meaning tactics you for sure should see, then it usually means you're not thinking about the position in the right way necessarily. And at some point, you kind of went astray mentally. And it's important to realize these situations because I think that if you can really buckle down and, and keep a clear and realistic view of the position, your likelihood of blundering is far lower. And oftentimes that can matter even more than just pure tactical ability. I've known some of the, you know, really amazing tacticians who would make blunders out of nowhere and it's nothing to do with their tactical ability. It's because they weren't looking at the position super clearly. In any case, uh, let's start with this one. So this was Wojtaszek against Mamidjarov. So they have this position and... It's, again, it looks like winning for black, maybe some work to do. Uh, obviously, the pieces are slightly awkward, and white's rooks are kind of harassing black's king a little bit. But really, you know, it shouldn't be like that crazy. So, rook a5 was played. And again, like, th this move, I think, by Mehmet Jarov is hardly a mistake. But I would say it's already kind of a, a step in the wrong direction. So, okay, he he would love to do something really aggressive here, but obviously white's threatening to take the pawn, which is quite annoying. But I would say that the key thing to realize here is that the main issue black has is that the pieces are just not coordinated and the white rooks are just really annoying here. So while I don't hate the move he played in the game, I actually really like this move knight to c6. So the idea of this move is that basically you're using your knight and bishop to shield your king. So there is no danger to your king, first and foremost. This may sound kind of ridiculous when you're facing two rooks in an endgame, but the fact is that 
even in the end game, the king can come under fire. So the idea is that you do this, you let white have this pawn and play rook b7. So most likely you're going to trade these pawns. And you might ask, well, Josh, you're up material. You don't really want to trade pawns. I, I would say that this is generally true, but I find that this is something that is one of the most overrated things that uh, players who are not as experienced talk about like they're basically like okay because you learn as a kid right you trade pieces not pawns when you're up material which again generally true but you have to realize that you only need you need a certain number of pawns if you had no pawns here of course it would be a draw right but because the king side is locked and you have two pairs of pawns if you can play rook takes b4 the g pawn's gonna fall and you have plenty of pawns to win the game you do not need any more pawns so there are times when if you can win on one side of the board by itself, you don't need pawns on the other side. Now, sometimes they're helpful. Sometimes they create more weaknesses. But other times you just have pawns that are just going to you have to defend. You have to play passively to defend. So if you can exchange them off, you can actually win more easily. And again, this is something I just find is misunderstood all of the time. So this to me looks looks quite reasonable. Moves like rook f8 can be met by king e7. I don't really think that these are problematic things so in the game however he played bishop e7 which again probably fine but the problem is that you are putting the bishop on a more passive square in order to defend this pawn now and it, it also keeps your rook passive one of the things i liked about knight c6 is that your rook then gets active uh, again i would say that if there's something which is underestimated compared to the overestimated feature of not trading pawns it's making sure your pieces are active I don't care if, what kind of position it is, an end game, an opening, like whatever it is. Like if you do not have active pieces, it's very hard to play. So I would say that making sure your pieces are active should be a real priority. So here, White played a very sneaky move because the rook on a5 doesn't do so much. So he played rook to a3. So again, I would say like the the reason why this is a sneaky move is because. Okay, obviously there there's there are ideas of playing rook d3 and stuff like that. But it's not even clear that it's a huge threat. I can play king c7. But the question is, how should black handle this position? So if you'd like, you can pause your video and come up with some ideas for yourself. Uh, in, in general, I think during videos, it's a good habit to do, whether the people telling you to do it uh, are the people doing the videos tell you or not. Because I think that... When you kind of try to solve problems for yourself, that's when it really gets in your head. Whereas if someone like me is just yapping at you and you <laughs> and I tell you what's going on exactly, it, it's just less helpful. It gets in there a lot less. So definitely I would encourage that here. But try to find like not only a good move, but uh, an idea and a plan for black like, and have logic based on your move. So again, I'm going to go forward. So if you uh, haven't, if you... Uh, didn't already are coming back this is I'm gonna go forward with what happened so in the game black played a move I really disliked so again if I'm thinking about this position as black I basically want to coordinate my guys I'm like okay my pieces are not coordinated the bishop is on b7 it guards the a pawn it's a little passive but there's nothing I can do about that that's fine at the moment it's my stupid king on d6 what is this king doing here <laughs> It's blocking the coordination between the rook and the knight. It's getting stuck everywhere. I understand it can help guard the f pawn, but I have to fix my king. So my move of choice would be king c7. And the idea now is that if the pawn on f6 gets attacked, for example, rook f8, I can play rook d6. So my rook on d6 guards the f pawn and guards the knight. Now you still have to be relatively careful here. For example, rook d3. Is a move and here I think that already like your pieces are kind of tied up so it's not as good as before you can see why I like knight c6 but you still have ideas so you would love to be able to play knight takes f5 here which is a nice little tactic but the problem of course is that there's rook c3 check and then the knight get, falls so that would be very unfortunate so I actually like the move bishop c6 you can play bishop e4 which is a nice tempo move but the problem is after rook d2 now you have to worry, if the bishop tries to retreat now, king e3 is a problem, because the knight cannot go to c2 uh, with check. So I much prefer the move bishop c6, with the idea that now if, now if king e3, you can play knight c2 check, just to show you. 
trade rooks, grab this guy with check, and then head to d5 guarding f6 very conveniently, and you're just winning. So, okay, black, white would have to find another idea, but basically I think black should probably win this game. Knight takes f5 is definitely, uh, is very likely a threat now, and white has to find ways to deal with it. Again, I, I don't think it's going to be so easy, but I think that black should eventually reel in the point. But notice how you're slightly less active here than in the position after knight c6, because here the rook on d6 is purely playing a passive role for the moment. Uh, but there are positions where even if you're slightly passive temporarily, as long as you have ways to unravel, you can count on your extra material bringing home the point eventually. Uh, however, Mamajarov played king d5. And again, it seems quite logical. You're trying to activate your king. So he probably also thought, like me, that the king was definitely a problem piece. But he didn't really count on the dangers here. And again, I think part of it is, I don't think, it's not that he didn't see king c7, rook d6. Someone like Mam as strong as Mamajara for sure will going, is going to see that. But what I would say, the, the main reason for this mistake is maybe greed. Uh, and now greed does not necessarily mean taking stuff. It can, obviously. Usually when we think of greedy players, we think of players who take too many pawns. But I would say that greed can also choose you, like, it's if you overvalue your position. You, like, he maybe evaluated his position as completely winning. Meaning, you know, oh, I should just bring my king in and win. And if you misevaluate in this fashion, it's much easier to blunder. Um... As, as I said, this has nothing to do with Mami Jarov's tactical ability. Tactically, he's an absolute monster. So, But if you overvalue your position, you're going to chase down lines which sometimes don't work. And it often is because you're trying... You think your position is completely winning, so you're looking for lines which completely win. Meaning that all you have to do is miscalculate a little bit once, and you, you'll end up going down a wrong path. Uh, whereas if you have a more realistic view of the position, I, I find that happens a lot less. So king d5 looks like a normal move in trying to activate your king. The problem is it does block your bishop. And it doesn't really solve the problem of the king because it doesn't get out of that box in the center. So white plays the move rook c3. And believe it or not, black has almost no moves. Um, so in the game, he played bishop c6. But try to find moves. It's like really difficult. Of course, the most amusing is if you try to move the rook. So, rook d6 runs into rook c5 mate, which is kind of hilarious when you think about it. <laughs> the move rook h7 runs into check, and the problem is that you can't really hang on to your knight. So you can try to block, but then I check and I take your bishop, so no, that doesn't work either. The best move is probably knight b5. But after rook check, probably... You should go back. Uh, of course, if you go back to d4, it's a draw. Um, and if you try to play, sorry, king c6, then check, and we get into this end game. which again, probably it's also a draw. I, I don't think black should lose this, but at the same time, once you give up your f-pawn and your g-pawn's weak, you probably shouldn't win either. So I would say that most likely this would also end in a draw. Now again, do I think that he didn't see knight b5? I, I almost can guarantee you he saw knight b5. But the reason he didn't play it once again, I think, is greed. You know, he still thought he was maybe winning. So again, when you think you're winning, you often will, you know, look for lines that are winning. So when you see a line is winning, you don't often question it. You're like, all right, it's the way it should be. So I think, again, he wanted to push. And again, I'm, I'm guessing, keep in mind that, you know, only he knows what was in his head. Maybe he just miscalculated horribly, which could happen. Uh, maybe he thought that the game was drawn after knight b5, but he thought it was also drawn after his move. There, there are so many possibilities. Uh, it could just be he missed white's next move. But, uh, again, it doesn't so much matter what he was thinking here, because we're trying to apply this to how we would think about it and how it can occur in your own game. So even if he didn't overestimate his position, it can definitely happen to any one of us. So, he played the move bishop c6, which seems like quite a reasonable move. The idea being, of course, now the, the rook maybe can move because the bishop can block on d7. It just kind of helps block the rook. I mean, there are all sorts of ideas behind this move. But here, white has a very strong move. And again, I, I think that 
I would say without flipping your board, try to figure out what white's best move here and what is very strong. Because, again, I find that uh, this is an exercise I do a lot, which is that you it's easy to do problems from your point of view, but you want to get used to doing problems from the opposing point of view as well. Uh, some of the people I study with really turned me on to this, and I, I think that it's a great idea because it's basically, it's easy to... You know, in general, it's easy to underestimate what your opponent's trying to do. But if you have to look at the position from their point of view, it kind of teaches you to appreciate what they're what they're doing, because you have to give their ideas as much um, attention as you do yours. So, uh, again, it's a good practice to kind of make sure you spot your opponent's ideas. So try to find pause your video uh, if you'd like and try to find a move for white. So I'll give a few seconds just to make sure <laughs> no spoilers or anything. But okay, I'm going to continue now. So, white played king e3, which is an excellent move. The idea being, rook c5 and taking the knight is a very clear threat. And again, because black didn't coordinate his pieces, this was the key. Because his pieces started out so dis discoordinated, that had to be his priority. Rather than keeping pawns on the board or going after white's pawns, that the priority has to be to coordinate your pieces. Once your pieces get coordinated, if you're up material, usually you'll be good. But he never really coordinated, and now he has serious problems. So there's just no really great way to play here, unfortunately, for him. So he played the move knight b3, which is an amazing resource. But what else can he do, right? I mean, rook c5 is a threat. If you play a move like rook b knight b5, I can give a check and go here and then take your bishop with check. So that's not going to be too fun. And you just have no moves. Like rook c5, king d4 is coming. So he found this, this move knight b3, which is an amazing resource. And again, an example of his creativity. But once again, white kind of slammed the doors on his hopes. So if he were to take this knight and then king here, there are actually some problems for white, mainly because I'm threatening, if you move the rook back, I'm threatening to play rook d3 check and then take your own rook. And a move like rook a3, I believe, runs into rook h7. And now, again, I'm threatening the rook as well as rook h3 check. So I think that you can actually draw by playing rook c8 or something like this. And then and then you, if takes rook, you take here. And somehow it's it's a drawish position. But okay, I mean, uh, Wojtaszek, however, found a really nice move, which is rook e6. And now, basically, you're done. <laughs> uh, it's kind of embarrassing, right? Because you're, you're, But this knight's hanging, and this king is trapped. Because keep in mind, if you move the knight anywhere, rook c5 is mate. Now, let's just check, mate. So this knight cannot move. And if you try to defend it with bishop a4, I play rook d3 check, and then rook here. And once again, you're kind of stuck, because you have to pitch a piece on d4, because if you go back to b5... You block your bishop. Again, notice peace coordination is paramount. I grab your rook, and you are done. So he, he played bishop b5, but then just dropped his piece. So again, we started from a position, you're just up two pieces for a rook, very comfortable, and one or two missed opportunities, and that's it. And again, for a lot of us, this wouldn't be, I mean, especially if we don't have lots of time, missing something like this is not that hard. I mean, this is not, I wouldn't say these were easy tactics or anything like this, but I would say for Mamed Yarov, this is below his level. So you can imagine if, if so, some of us who are weaker than him <laughs> miscalculate or misevaluate, we can make much worse errors. And again, not, not that even these guys can't blunder really, really horribly, but I would say that errors that are beneath our level are usually caused by us not evaluating properly, uh, oftentimes overestimating our chances and not really seeing what our opponents are up to and what they can do. But in this case, again, I think greed was a, a large part of it. Not greed as far as wanting to take stuff, but like wanting to keep the queenside pawns on the board. Uh, thinking that he could play king d5 and really just try to run with the king rather than being more conservative, king c7, rook d6. So there are times when overestimation and greed really can count against us. And again, a, a player as tactically strong as Mary Majorov can make blunders that are way below... Um, where he is. And one of the things I've found is that players who are very realistic about their position tend to blunder less. Uh, there are, there are, I would say chess players in general are fairly optimistic, <laughs> which, uh, strong chess players in particular are, you know, 
optimism is, is a decent thing, but I would say that it can work against you in situations like this. So you have to be, being optimistic is nice, trying to play aggressively and for the win, if you want to say it, call it that way is really nice, but you have to also have some objectivity in order to not kind of butcher your position sometimes. In any case, uh, I have one more example for you guys. So this game was played recently, uh, just yesterday, I believe, in a in a norm tournament going on currently in St. Louis. Uh, it was played by a friend of mine named uh, JJ. His last name is actually uh, Ali Marandi, um, a Turkish GM. And uh, unfortunately, this was a hard game for me to watch because <laughs> he's a friend of mine, and to see this happen to him was was kind of bad. But I would say let, let's try to figure out like what happened because this was an incredible scene in that, you know, again, JJ is like 2,500 plus GM and he lost this game in 13 moves as white. And again, for a GM to do that is, is almost unthinkable, right? But again, we're going to try to break it down and figure out how these things happen. Because again, it's not to do with tactical level. I think JJ gets like over 50 on puzzle rush. <laughs> you know, he's, there's nothing wrong with his tactical level. Let's put it that way. Um, so really it's about how you see the position and how you determine moves. So again, I think this was kind of the start. So I, I don't really know. This is kind of a, I'd say, hyper modernish line. And, and I don't know exactly what the theory is currently on this position or anything like that. Um, to me, though, he chose a very greedy path. He played D takes C5. Again, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to allow C4. Maybe you think that you're going to get attacked. But ultimately, maybe it was slightly wiser I don't know he he took on c5 which again you're opening up your queen and rook it's hard to argue with it isn't it's a horrible move but um black played knight d7 and again I, I just think he took a greedy path like I understand wanting to try to punish white's play for whatever reason but really probably you gotta just let him take on c5 <laughs> um I mean even if you play a move like f3 and then get your knight out I mean the game still goes right like there's nothing horrible happening and I would say it's relatively normal. Uh, he took on d5. So again, I, I don't want to say this is exactly why he lost, because objectively his position is still playable. But I would say that once you get to this situation, you have to have like danger bells, like danger, danger, all over the place. And if you are not looking at this position, if you are not playing white here and are terrified, you're very likely to lose very quickly. <laughs> and again, maybe he already didn't like his position. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. But... Uh, I, I would say that you have to be very scared here because basically this bishop on g7 is an absolute monster. And at the moment, there's only the bishop and queen playing. But as soon as black gets in, knight takes c5 and bishop e6, I think that you're pretty much done. Because there's just, f you have four pieces attacking you. And at the moment, you only have a queen defending. And a queen is a terrible defender. Uh, and in this case, it's, it's often a terrible defender, I should say. And in this case, there's no exception. The queen is, is not a good defender. Um, so you would love to play a move like bishop c4 to try to get the bishop in the defense. But even there, um, I could play knight takes c5. Bishop comes out next. I mean, white's, white's pretty much lost. Like, already it's that bad. But JJ, to his credit, finds an excellent move here for white. And the only way really to stay in the game uh, that I can see. And it's very counterintuitive. So if you guys would like to pause your video and find it, uh, go right ahead. I'll give you give it a second. So if you are ready to continue, here we go. He played the move bishop g5, which is quite a move. Um, I mean, it, it looks kind of ridiculous because you're not developing a piece. But the idea solely is to try to discourage black from taking on c5. Because black can still take on c5 here. Knight takes c5 is totally playable, but you have to start sacrificing stuff. Bishop takes um, e7 is possible. Queen b4, for example, trying to go after b2. And again, this is kind of hairy, right? But at least you're up material. Like, if black doesn't mate you, you're, you have good chances. Again, I, I would be terrified. This is not the way I like to play but at the same time objectively maybe you can get away with this I don't know it looks very dangerous but at least you're forcing your opponent to, to give up stuff 
you can play a move like e6, but it looks kind of lame. Now the queen goes back. You still have bishop e7 in the case of taking on c5. Probably you're okay here. So he plays rook e8, which is a perfectly logical move, and you might ask, well, how did bishop g5 help now? But in this moment, and again, this is super important, you have to realize what is going on with your position. You have to realize, first of all, there is huge, huge danger. Uh, that's the first and foremost thing you have to realize here. Huge danger, we've already covered that. Next, you have to figure out, what exactly do I need to accomplish in order to possibly survive? <laughs> So again, if you'd like to pause and, and try to find a, a good move for white, please do so. Otherwise, I'm going ahead. So basically, in the game, he played the move knight f3, uh, which is a big mistake. Bishop c4, again, was the only move. And, and it should be easy to find when you realize this is the idea, because that's the whole point of bishop g5. Once you, you force your opponent to play rook e8, bishop c4 is a tempo move, meaning that there's no time to take on c5, because f7 pawn hangs. And this is why his move bishop g5 was so strong. It's just a pity he didn't find the follow-up. And again, I'm not exactly sure. Maybe he didn't realize why bishop g5 was so strong. Maybe he was missing something else. But the idea is that you have to, again, realize you're in huge danger and that you have to play only moves. And when you realize you have to play only moves, you're much more likely to find them. If you don't know you're looking for only moves, you're probably going to be in some trouble. And the idea now is, okay, white, black can play knight e5, but at least now your bishop can draw back to b3 and help guard your king. If bishop e6, for example, queen could go back to d2, threatening the queen exchange, poly black avoids it. Again, you're still going to get attacked, but at least you have a defender. Your bishop on b3 helps you defend. And, it mean, and you can probably also trade off an attacker. So it means that you have chances to survive. So would I rather be black here? Probably. But I would say that you can at least maybe be up material and maybe have defensive chances. But he had to realize that this was the moment. You, If you don't get your bishop over to the king, queen side to help defend your king, you are in big trouble. He played knight f3, which is a completely logical developing move. And again, maybe he missed something very particular. But after knight takes c5, he's basically busted. Now, here he blundered. And this was the moment where, okay, he blundered and had to resign right away. But I would say that even if he didn't blunder here, the mistakes had already come. So it's easy to see this position and go, oh, he missed the next move for, for black. But I would say that the real mistake was kind of before, not realizing how severe the situation was and realizing, okay, I have to play only moves to, to stay in the game. Uh, so bishop c4 would, would have done it here. I think he's already busted. Uh, if bishop c4 now, bishop e6 is just too strong. And there's really no great move here. There are ways maybe to stay in the game for a, f a little bit, but objectively it's a lost position at this point. He played the move knight d4. And again, maybe he was just counting on this move entirely. But even if black doesn't have the move they have here, and again, you guys can pause your video and find it. I mean, it, it's not the hardest move in the world, but uh, again, keep in mind a GM, a GM just missed this, a, a strong GM. So <laughs> it's... Uh, it's quite something. So yes, of course, the game ended with knight d3 check, attacking the queen. Uh, and again, even without knight d3 check, probably it's still bad. But the, the point is that, how does a, a GM this strong miss knight d3 check? This is a, a tactic which normally he would solve. If you gave him black to play here, he wouldn't even think. He would solve it probably in less than a second. I'm not exaggerating. So how could he possibly miss it? And again, it's because you do not have a clear view of the position, because you're under pressure. And I'm sure he realized that he was in danger when he was in this position. There's no way a player of his strength didn't realize that. But he probably didn't realize that, okay, it means that I have to, first of all, kind of keep calm. It's hard to keep calm when you're about to get brutally murdered <laughs> on the queen side. But you have to keep calm and realize, what do I have to accomplish? And again, it was get that piece on c4. <laughs> get the bishop defending. And he played the first move of the only way to play with bishop g7, bishop g5 rather, but then he didn't follow it up. So again, I mean, I hope this gives you at least a little insight into how... Because again, I get asked this a lot. Like, how, how does a player this strong miss knight d3? Does he need to go and do a bunch of tactics? There's, tactical ability has nothing to do with these errors when the players are this strong. And probably in a lot of your games, even if tactics is something you have to work on, and spoiler alert, pretty much all of us have to work on tactics. But I would say it's rarely purely tactical ability that is the problem. Usually it was, 
not seeing the position in a clear way, and that makes you at least more vulnerable to missing tactics. It doesn't mean that he's going to miss knight d3 check almost ever. He did here. It's almost never going to happen, regardless of how he's misevaluating. But I would say that it makes you more prone to making these errors if you are not seeing the position clearly. So anyway, I hope you found this video interesting and hopefully somewhat helpful. And uh, definitely stay tuned for more videos. Uh, if you really like these videos, definitely um, you know subscribe to this channel. And uh, I'll provide a link also to a Patron page where you can get more updates and stuff like that. Anyway, thank you very much, and see you next time.